With us today is Keith Ferrazzi. He has written most recently the book Leading Without Authority, How the New Power of Co-Elevation Can Break Down Silos, Transform Teams, and Reinvent Collaboration. He's the number one best-selling author of Never Eat Alone and Who's Got Your Back. He spent over 30 years coaching executive teams, uh, and I'm lucky enough to call him a friend. Uh, he's a, a really lovely guy. And so, you know, as always, the criteria for being on this podcast has to do with being an exceptional leader and also a stellar human being. And, uh, and I'm glad to say that Keith fits both. So, Keith, and, welcome. And, 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 and also having shared tea and coffee in your, in your living room in New York. Yes, right. Actually, knowing me personally helps. Um, but it's great. It's, uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad we've gotten to know each other. And I'm happy to have you. Welcome to the Leadership Podcast. Peter, I was looking forward to catching up with you. I'm, I'm really looking forward just to a great dialogue with a great thinker like yourself. Thank you. You're kind. Um, uh, Keith, what is leading without authority? <clears throat> so, as you know, my my primary focus is I coach executive teams. I don't coach executives. I coach the team and the team's performance. And I have noticed over about you know a 20 year process of doing that, that there are some mindsets associated with leadership that some people are still clinging to that are fundamentally broken and they need to shift to meet the pressures of the marketplace today. And of course, the pre pressures of the marketplace today, post, post immediate COVID crisis. And I say post immediate COVID crisis, we may be in COVID crisis for, you know, six months, a year, who knows, but, um, you know, we, you and I both know organizations have to meet constant transformation today. Organizations have to not just adopt agility, but a word that I'm calling radical adaptability. And in order to do that, it is not the, anymore the role of a leader to be the hub and spoke. It is not the role of the leader to play whack-a-mole of all of the insights, coaching, you know, push toward collaboration, babies, whatever it takes, right? It, I believe leaders need to begin to unleash the team to a new word, co-elevate. A, a, a team that co-elevates is a team that is unbounded by org structure. A team that co-elevates is a team that says, we've got a vision. Who do we need to team with to get the job done? Um, we've been talking about breaking down silos for a long time. We've got to start organizing teams around breaking down silos. Leading Without Authority focuses on that. Then the team needs to co-create. You know, so 71% of teams, 71% of teams say that they don't get value from being a part of a team. Meaning they're sitting in the team, they bring their work to the team, they report out to the team, they plug their work into the team, but is their work exponentially better because of being a part of the team? No. So let me ask you a question. Uh -huh. Let me actually interrupt for a second and ask you a question about this. Because in the book, you say that we're all hardwired for co-elevation. And co-elevation so. is really like supporting each other and helping me help you be successful. Um, and my question as I was reading that is, is that really true? And given what you've just said, which is most of us are sitting in meetings going, this isn't working for me. It might be working for other people, but it's not working for me. And evidence seems to point to people prioritizing themselves and often being threatened by the success of other people. So I'm curious, like I was curious when you said we're all hardwired, I, I wonder about that, like whether this is really something we have to learn to prioritize the interest of the group over our individual interest, or whether this truly is something we just have to remember. So anthropologically, when I say hardwired, I mean, what is the species hardwired to do, right? And we both know that 70,000 years ago, the species to survive, we were born in tribes. And so what is hardwired is to thrive in a tribe. But when you spin ahead to today, past, uh, you know, the books like Bowling Alone, which was basically calling out the fact that we are living in, in isolation and in, in silos in the world, um, the worst of all things occur, which is we are living in tribes, which is our natural instinct, but our tribes are tribes of one or tribes of two or three. Right. The key for a leader is to demand that the team thinks of itself as us. 
And that is a leadership trait that is not often coached to. Mm -hmm. So I watch leaders be very happy. Now, they don't say it this way, but they're very happy to have individual members of the team come behind other members of the team's back with conflict avoidance and tell the CEO what the other members of the team are not doing well. Instead of having us have enough conviction, courage, but also care to bring this out in the open. I literally just dealt with it in my own organization this morning where two individuals were, were, were lobbying against each other in terms of the, the relationship. And I, I do what I often do. I very awkwardly get the other person on the phone and I bring ridiculous and full transparency to the dialogue. And so, you know, that's, that's my solution as a CEO to coach the team to don't do that shit. Right. Right. I have no appetite for people talking behind each other's backs. I think it's as bad as stealing from your expense account. That level of cowardice, that level of erosion of shareholder value, risk management, innovation. And, and I think it's just shitty, mediocre leadership that it's allowed. So I, and I agree. deal with it. You deal with it all the time. Right. You deal with it all the time. You right, and I right. see it. Right. And I agree. you hear the passion. And you hear the frustration and the anger. And so I bring this shit out in the open in my coaching. And I think and I make it, yeah. And I think there's very little that we do that increases shareholder value as much as breaking down the silos that, you know, of like individual interest in order to get right. people to collectively align behind kind of a common focus. And the reason when we go in, it doubles and triples the stock value is because even people who call us in, who are already a high bar, because if they've called us in, they're already interested. They want to be better. They want to be yeah. better, right? Which a lot of people don't want to be better. But so even the people who call us in, it's already a high bar. It's rampant, which makes, which, which first of all is why I think the book is important, but also why I question whether we're really hardwired that way. And I don't know that that matters or not, but, but it's because... I, I think well, look, I, we I, live I, in a I, state look, of fear. I get your point about the hard work. But my, my point is, if, if we were hardwired to distrust each other, yes, I could have easily said that too. We're hardwired to distrust. That's true too. And that's, that's what prejudice is born from. And this past weekend, depending on when this is watched, we are just literally coming out of a weekend of suffering of national riots. Um, where, where us and them was at the forefront of the dialogue. Right. Whether it was around racism or economic disparity, or what was the trigger for the behaviors this weekend, or both, they're about us and them. And what I love, and, by the way, what I, the moment I love about these moments is when you see a police officer put down their batons, which has gotten a lot of press too, and said, I'm going to walk with you. And to do that, requires, I think, an overcoming of fear, meaning that police officer has, has to say, I'm going to take my protection, the stuff that I hide behind that, you know, the badge and the, the stuff that I hide behind, and I'm going to put it aside and I'm going to walk with you without that. And that leap of faith is rewarded, but it's also scary, right? Well, in, in chapter, uh, chapter three, um, earning permission to lead. And my philosophy of earning permission to lead is a methodology called serve, share, and care. Mm -hmm. And what I find is that, first of all, in the beginning of the book, you have to understand, I, I'm making an assumption. And that is, if you're going to be transformational, then you have to see your team as a group of individuals that you don't control. Right. That's the first awakening. Right. So what, what I often see in companies is people fighting for more control right so that they can be transformational right so i go ahead you're about to say well something. i'm curious how you help people let go of control because i think that's so essential and i know you do it in well, your work I don't let go I, I understand that perspective what i do is I, I, you don't think your way into a new way of acting you act your way into a new way of thinking agreed and so when i'm coaching I hold them by the hands and say, okay, I understand that you're going into this project with an assumption of your team that you control. 
and then these individuals that you have to get buy-in from and these individuals that are obstructionists and you're pissed off by, right? But let's imagine both the people from buy-in, which I've always thought is bullshit. I don't like buy-in. Buy-in means I baked an answer and I'm selling it to you. Right. You should buy into my answer. Um, let's get that in those individuals and the people that are obstructionists. Let's get them in the room and let's really figure out how to co-create. And there's an entire chapter about how do you really do co-creation well. Right. And you and I have the benefit of coming in as coaches and we can call a co-creation meeting. And our ability to manage that meeting well is easier often than somebody inside the company. So as coaches, we get to do this with a little bit of superpower because we have that permission. But how does an individual inside of a company call a co-creation? And the first thing that I do is I get the person to start small enough. And you don't start with a room full of 25 vipers in a pit and say, okay, now we're going to try to make this work. You start incrementally. You start with your vision and you invite your first co-creator in. Now you have to be awakened. This is a mindset shift, but you have to be awakened that the vision is no longer your vision. It's your, it's your, it's both of your vision. I right. the, the book is, when I talk about, there's a chapter called who's your team. And there's a line I use, which is the first person you invite into your team, you're inviting them into their team. And when you invite somebody into their team, you're inviting them in to co-create. And the good news is I really do believe that co-creation yields transformation more than individual ideation, meaning more than two or three people coming together will create a better answer than you will by yourself. And, and that, yeah. Well, I'm curious about, so, cause you, you coach teams, uh, not necessarily individuals. And I'm curious about when you're helping someone who's oriented towards buy-in, meaning they're saying, I've got an idea. I need to convey it to the leadership team so that I get their buy-in and we spread it through the organization and how you help them shift their mindset to one of co-creation. Yeah, and it's, I usually do it through action. So I actually hold their hand through the act of inviting somebody in differently, right? So we are just doing this down at a, a very large insurance company in the South. And, you know, they, the, I was hired by the chief operating officer and the focus was how do we re-engineer our operations process, which is a very large call center operation. And the reality was we could have spent all the time we wanted on the call center, but the real breakthrough is needed to happen in terms of how the sales organization uses the call center. Right. Right. And, and so we could squeeze all the improvement out of the call center and we'll still not meet our, our numbers of headcount reduction plus customer satisfaction. It's a great unless, example. Right. It's, it's a great unless example. Unless we change how many people in the call center are, are calling us for stupid shit. Right. Right. So, so what we did was I, and they, but here's the problem. The call center didn't think it had permission to get the people in the sales organization to change their behavior. One of the reasons was higher up in the organization, there seemed to be some belief that two of the executives didn't like each other, one in sales and one in ops. So literally we're talking about significant shareholder value eroded because two executives don't like each other. Right. And again, I get indignant when I see that and I bring those two people in and I talk to them like I would any other adult and I let them know that that is thievery from shareholders and that their indulgence. So chapter two, I talk about the set, the six deadly excuses for why we don't do this. And one of them is indulgence. You've, you've literally indulged your resentment at the sake of your fiduciary responsibility, right? Keep doing that and you should be fired. So let me ask you two questions. I love this. I love this, Keith. So two questions. One is, I'm, you know, from my perspective, if I'm that sales leader, I don't see it. I'm guessing, but I'm curious whether this plays out. Like, I don't see it as I just don't like this guy. I see it as ops is self-involved, they are small-minded, they don't appreciate 
the role that sales has to play in in kind of generating revenue, and they're worried about their dots and uh, I's and T's, and and I'm and I'm really worried about you know leading a customer centric organization, this damn company, right? right. Growth. Right. So it's not that I don't like you. Like you're a perfectly nice guy. I'd love to go for a beer with you, or a perfectly nice woman. I'd love to go for a beer with you. But but I but but you know it's not a personal thing. It's just I think you're incompetent. And so I'm, and I don't know that they would use that language or say that, but more often than not, it's 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 not a personal, the, the, it's a personal resentment, but it's that's how a professional disagreement is showing up. How do you so, how do you help them around? Yeah. That? So look, so you and I, you're you're in my job. The reason we're brought into these companies in these situations is we're holding space to be to have these two people be heard. Right. And. The first thing I do is with the use of a book like this, I awaken somebody to their indulgence. Once people start to think through the logic of this stuff, they start to realize that they are indulging behavior that isn't particularly high levels of professional behavior. Right. Right. And the awakening, there are a couple of, there's one chapter in this book that really hits you over the head with an awakening. That's chapter two. And the chapter is called, It's All on You. And I use one of the analogies I use is my foster son, who was a real son of a bitch. Um, 12 years of age, he had been in 20 homes. You know we're recording this, right? I just want yes, to be, okay. I know, that's right. <laughs> anyway, he's, he's 21 now, he can hear it. Um, so at 12 years of age, he was, he was horrific and angry and violent, literally violent. There were times my partner and I literally thought that there was a good shot of our losing our lives to this boy at some point. Um, literally, like go to bed and think, there's a good shot. Right. Um, and but yet my responsibility to my family, to that boy, to my, my higher power was that I would go 99.9% .9 of the way to be his father, even when he wasn't being my son. And, you know, I couldn't cross my arms and say, when you're my son, I'm, when you meet me halfway, right. too much when you meet me halfway occurs in business. Right. And then we stop. And I, I always talk about everybody in companies that are that are working against you. You and I both know that there are more bad words shared about headquarters from the field than there are about the competition. Right. right. Um, and and I make people aware that these things that are going on that piss you off, that you're indignant about and they shouldn't happen, they're just market forces. Chill out. Just like an entrepreneur faces an obstacle in a, in a government policy or, or competition comes up with something new, they're just market forces. What are you going to do? How are you going to work it? Right? But we get ourselves twisted emotionally. So mm -hmm. part of it is literally me decloaking the, the, the allowance of this victimization and this De demonization that does exist. Once that occurs, I open up a window. And then with that window, I try to build some empathy. Because if you start to under really understand where ops is coming from, if you start to really understand where sales is coming from, then you start to have a perspective that you might not have all of the data and you might not have all of the perspective. And this right. sounds very rudimentary, but you and I both have lots of stories where our job was to uncloak empathy. And with that, you could get to a place of, of co-creation. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what the book teaches you to do. Meaning, look, you and I are coaches. We come into a company. My, what I was trying to do when I wrote this book was make everybody a coach. Right. The original intention of the book was that I thought every leader really needs to be a coach of their peers making their peers better so that they could co-create. And of course, the answer is you also have to make yourself better so that you can co-create. Right. And then you've got to do the hard work of holding the space for co-creation, right? And so that's why I wrote this book to put into everybody's hands what you and I do as, as consultants. Keith, you've given a number of different uh, examples of brave conversations, of bringing two people in a room, of you know your own organization, even if they report to you in your own organization. Like we both know, and this is part of 
co-creation and leading without authority is that even though people report to us, it doesn't mean that they do what we say and that, you know, we control them. Like that's the whole point of what you're writing and it's the truth. And, and when you're consulting, bringing into, you know, a sales leader and an ops leader, neither of whom report to you and neither of whom, you know, have to do what you say. And I'm curious, th these feel like brave conversations to me. And I'm, I'm curious about um, whether you're scared when you have them, whether like what goes on for you, what humps do you have to get over, if any, that allow you to sit down with, you know, a couple of people or a room of people, et cetera, and, and say, here's how I see it. Yeah. Um, so I, I grew up in Pittsburgh. My old man was an unemployed steel worker. My mom was a cleaning lady. <clears throat> and I never, and as a poor kid, I never felt I deserved to be in the room. My parents got me into wealthy schools to get a good education. They got full scholarships. And I never felt I deserved to be in the room. And, and I've lived with that insecurity all my life. And mm -hmm. it creates sometimes abhorrent behavior, like when I was younger and even now bragging, like the need to, to credentialize myself so that I feel like I, I deserve to be there, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and also the fear of someone's reaction. I also had an angry father that like a lot of Italian immigrant dads, he, he led with authority. He didn't lead without authority. Um, and so, yeah, I, I have a, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a quick digression. When I read Ray Dalio's book, I looked at it and I even had a chance to talk to Ray at the TED conference recently, a year ago. And I said, Ray, you know, it's kind of easy for you in your book principles to talk about ruthless candor, peer-to-peer -peer feedback, having exit discussions online about each other after every meeting where you grade each other. I said, Ray, that's easy for you because Ray, you hire assholes. And you have no problem. You have no problem uh, because you hire for resilience. I know plenty. You and I both know people by name who've gone to that company and bounced after two months because they couldn't hack it. Right. And I'm not saying they should hack it. Um, the rest of us have to deal with egos. We have to deal with insecurities. We have to deal with fear. I have to deal with my own every moment. Right. And I actually think mine are grander than most because I've got a lot to overcome in terms of psychological challenges that I've had when I was feeling insecure and not worthy. So I, maybe it's with that empathy that I know that giving feedback to another human, you own making sure it lands with care. Mm -hmm. And that was the conversation I had with these two individuals this morning. I said, you know, you both with through conflict avoidance, you, you did end runs and you've not served our mission. And now you're pissed off at each other because you both talk behind each other's backs mm -hmm. and you're not serving our mission. Would you both of you recognize that you're both trying to do your best? Would you please have a conversation that wipes the slate clean and starts and says, what are we trying to co-create here? Right. And so, you know, I generally find that if I keep my North Star truthful and I get my my insecurity out of the middle of it and i keep my care at the forefront right and my sense of service at the forefront then i get away with a lot mm -hmm. right i get away with a lot um so yeah you're right actually i was not modeling that well i was i was saying to you with some some level of bombastic voice and tone how i would say two executives should talk to each other and sometimes I will say it with all of that bravado if they both know I care for them. Mm -hmm. But if they don't know I care for them, then I have to do the tone I've just now used. Right. And I have to lead with serve, share, and care. Serve. They have to know I'm here to be of service to them. Share. I have to share vulnerably that I know exactly how they feel and I've done the same stupid shit myself. Right? Care. They have to know deeply that I care for them as individuals, as well as the business that they're both serving, that I'm serving. Serve, share, and care. And I, I go into detail. And the reason Adam Grant loved this book so much 
is because he said, you know, there's this is the first real model. We've all been talking about working in networks. This is the first roadmap at a very granular level and human level to figure out how to do it. Thank you for that, Keith. Um, talk to us about remote teams and the work that you're doing with remote teams. And it's something that everybody's sort of struggling to adapt to you, uh, you. You know, in your book, you talk about the way to create transformative outcomes is radical inclusion plus bold input plus agility. And that seems to be like particularly important at a time like this. So I'd love to hear uh, yeah. some of your thoughts on it. Well, I wish, you know, if I had had one month to rewrite the book a little bit, it would have been easy. But in a few years ago, um, John Chambers, when he was CEO of Cisco, gave me uh, two million bucks to research what are the new rules for people in a virtual world? Because they had WebEx, telepresence, et cetera. And my belief was it's fine to have the systems, but what are the people rules to use them? And so I, I solicited at Harvard Business Review and we went on a journey of 20 research studies that we did and published them all in HBR. Um, there's a website I we created with all of these resources. It's called virtualteamswin.com. So virtualteamswin.com. And um, what I found was that Virtual or remote teams will degrade their performance unless the stuff that you, the critical stuff that used to happen accidentally or serendipitously becomes purposeful. So for instance, candor and challenging in a room. You get less bold candor and bold challenges in a room in a virtual meeting than you did in a physical meeting. And we, and we just talked about it. You didn't get much in physical meetings. But you got more of it in those walk down the hallway, around the corner conversations, which now even happen less. So it, candor can be radically eroded in a virtual environment unless you make it bold and you put it forthright. Well, and so, I imagine also some of that has to do with groups versus pairs. Like it's hard to be, to, to be really honest with people when four other people or 10 other people or 20 other people are watching. And unless... Yeah, unless you recontract it, right? And that's what I call for. So there is a there is a process I call recontracting, which we give for free at the uh, virtualteamswin.com resource page. We think that there are a set of new social norms for executive teams. There are new social norms for executive teams. One of them is the willingness to challenge in a room. So the way I do the challenging in a room is. We stop in the middle of the meeting and instead of just saying, OK, who has a challenge for what was just said? And then you'll hear crickets. I break them into small groups, which is so easy to do on Zoom. Push a button, break into small groups. And in the small group, they identify what's not being said that needs to be said. And then they come back and I get it. So it's what I've done is I practicified high performing teams in a remote environment. And we actually created a product. You and I were just talking and my business models changed. Right. I used to have do what you did, you know, bigger, larger, longer term projects with teams. Now we're offering like a eight thousand dollar boot camp for how do you reboot your team in a remote environment? Right. And, you know, I find that that might be, you know, an entry into a different product, which would be, you know, an ongoing coaching, et cetera. But it's also just a good product and I can actually train other coaches to do it. But we need to renegotiate the social contract. Right. Will we give each other open candor in a room? Yes or no? That's a social norm. The answer was no before. The answer needs to be yes today. Right. And then, of course, we need the skills to do it with empathy and with care and in service. Because and otherwise we're back to Ray Dalio. And that's where the coaching comes in. Right. Yeah. Right. So at least at some point, or reading the book. I mean, I'm trying to do a combination of this is the cheapest product offering I've got, right? Then you can go to the, the remote reboot and then you can go to the hire a coach from Frazzy Greenlight or hire Keith. Same as, and I you know just that idea of these stepping stones, all of our business is changing. You know, we right. just, you know, it's all up in the air. Right. Keith, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. Keith, uh, Keith Ferrazzi has written Leading Without Authority, How the New Power of Co-Elevation Can Break Down Silos, Transform Teams, 
and reinvent collaboration. Uh, as always, a pleasure. Thank you so much for being on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much. Thank you.